This lecture is on the material for Chapter 4, Overhead Set 6. And this is our first one on group theory, per se, rather than just symmetry. So you'll want to have a copy of that handy to make notes, either in written form or in an alternative electronic form to the one you're using here. All right, so we want to talk about representations of molecular properties. That's what this is all about. Now, we're routinely going to set up the representation of a problem in terms of a set of vectors located on the atoms of interest. For example, when we talk about molecular vibrations, we'll imagine a little set of three Cartesian coordinates on each and every one of the atoms. And we'll want to see how the symmetry of the molecule transforms these various vectors. Now, the set of vectors for any property that we might want to represent is what we call a basis for a representation, or more simply, a basis set. It's the mathematical behavior of the vectors, the mathematical description of that behavior, under the symmetry operations of the point group of the molecule that forms what we call a representation of the group. Now, that representation in many cases, in fact, in most cases, will be the sum of some very basic representations, which are called irreducible representations. All of these representations have a set of numbers that we would call characters. Now, in general group theory, we can construct groups of things other than numbers, as a matter of fact. And as we'll see here, in some cases, we'll be uh, constructing uh, representations that are not simple numbers, but are rather matrices. But the kind of representations we want to talk about first, the irreducible representations, are composed of what we call characters. And you'll see zeros and plus and minus ones. As we get to some of the more complex ones, you'll see plus and minus two, plus and minus three. And then there are some that actually use the imaginary integer square root of minus one, or expressions involving i. So we'll start out simple. We're going to look at C2V, as we've seen before. Now, you remember that we had the multiplication table worked out for C2V. C2V had some special things that I just remind you about here. One is that all of the combinations of C2V's operations in the multiplication table are commutative, and therefore this is an abelian group. And it also so happens that every one of the operations is its own inverse. So we get a diagonal of E's along here in our multiplication table. Those are not general results. They are just results for this kind of a group. But nonetheless, what we want to do is we want to see if we can make a set of substitutions for the operations E, C2, sigma V, and sigma V prime such that those substitutions obey the multiplication results that we have here. One of the most simple and seemingly trivial ones is one that we could call 1111, and I'm giving it the designation in general here, gamma sub 1. Gamma is used in group theory to indicate a representation, and until we identify what this one is, we're just going to call it gamma 1. All right, now to test that this is a genuine irreducible representation of the group, what I want to do is look at the substitutions and how they behave in the multiplication. So here I'm saying E is 1, C2 is 1, sigma V is 1, and sigma V prime is 1. And so here's my multiplication table. And of course, I get nothing but 1s. And you say, well, of course, that isn't a very interesting result. And yet this is a very necessary irreducible representation that must be in every group. It is that representation consisting of all ones as substituents for all of the operations of the group. OK, so that first one is a representation which in C2V is given the label A1. We'll talk about these labels a little bit more later. Uh, they are Mulliken symbols in general. So we have the set of characters 1, 1, 1, and 1. And this one is the totally symmetric representation in C2V. So the takeaway in general is that in every group, there is a similar 
irreducible representation consisting of all ones, which is the totally symmetric representation for that group. Okay, now I could make the substitution 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, somewhat less trivial. And if we look at this, it does indeed give us the results that we expect from the multiplication table. For example, if you take sigma v and multiply by sigma v prime in either order, you expect to get C2. All right, I have a 1 here. Well, I substituted 1 for C2, so that is the result. And you could go through the, and verify that this indeed does conform to the multiplication table of C2V. So we now have another irreducible representation, and this one's called A2, the set of characters 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. All right, we could continue in that manner, but I won't belabor the point. We could come up with two more and only two more. The next one is called B1, it's 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, and the last one is B2, 1 minus 1, minus 1, 1. Again, these are the Mulliken labels. Now, if we tried any other set of substitutions, it will not work. For example, I might see these first four and say, oh, I can do this game. Let me just make the substitutions minus 1, minus 1, 1, and 1. Well, if you do that, you get a completely wrong set of results. For example, taking that one I picked out before, sigma v times sigma v prime, here I would get a 1. I'm supposed to get a minus 1 because that's the substitution I've made for C2. So this is not an irreducible representation. It is not a representation, in fact, in C2v. So we're limited to those basic four irreducible representations. Okay, now this is all information that is gathered together in what we call a character table. And Appendix C of your text has character tables for all the groups that we might encounter in real molecules. So far, what we have is a rudimentary character table that just shows the characters and their Mulliken des designations as individual representations. If you look in the back of the book, you'll find that the character table for C2V looks a little bit more complex. This part here is all this stuff in here. And then there's a column here where we have some notations Z, X, and Y, and RZ, RY, and RX. And then in the final column, we have some binary uh, products, X squared, Y squared, Z squared, XY, XZ, and YZ. Well, what we want to do right now is look at how these are generated and eventually we'll look at how we can apply that to a more general case. We'll then come back and talk a little bit about these direct product representations here. So for the time being we want to take a look at the basic character table and apply it to a vector. And We're going to start out achingly simple. We're going to look at how a unit vector z is transformed under the operations of C2v. Now here's my little vector z. Its base is at the origin of the Cartesian coordinate system, 0, 0, 0, and it extends a unit up along z. So it's simply described in terms of one coordinate. Now what I want to do is ask how does z change, if at all, under the operations E, C2, sigma V, and sigma V prime. And I want to represent those mathematically. Now this is a one-dimensional problem here, so I can represent the transformation of Z by multiplying the original position of Z by a one-by-one -one matrix. Basically, it's just a single uh, integer multiplied times Z. So for example, here is E, E it remains Z, uh, or rather Z remains itself under E, and so I could represent that mathematically by taking Z's original position and multiplying it by plus 1. And I put it in brackets here to indicate that I'm taking this in a very formal sense to be uh, a matrix. C2, well C2 just spins the vector around itself. That doesn't change it in any meaningful way. So plus 1z is the product here. And 
sigma v and sigma v prime have the same result, so I have a plus 1 and a plus 1 here. Now, if we take the four operator matrices, one for each of the operations of the group, and gather them together, they become the characters of a representation in C2V. And by what we've already seen, that representation is A1. So we could make a notation out here in our character table of a unit vector Z as an indication that Z transforms as A1 in C2V. So what we say then is that in C2V, the vector z transforms as the a1 representation, the totally symmetric representation. Another way of saying the same thing would be to say, in C2v, the vector z belongs to the a1 species, the totally symmetric species. The term species is just a shorthand for irreducible representation, which you have to admit is a bit of a mouthful. So I'll go back and forth between calling things irreducible representations and species, and just be ready for that. Okay, now, let's take a vector that actually has something happening to it under C2V, and that would be the unit vector x. The unit vector x, under the operations of C2V, has the following results. E applied to x gives us x, so we have plus 1 times x again. C2, though, changes the orientation of x into the negative of itself, so it becomes minus x. To achieve that, we would multiply by minus 1 times x. Sigma v is the plane xz, and the xz doesn't do anything to the sense of x, because x lies in that plane, so it's a plus 1 there. The sigma v prime, on the other hand, is the yz plane, the plane to which x is perpendicular, and that would flip it into the negative of itself. So this gives me a minus 1 here. Once again, culling out the individual operator matrices as characters of a representation, I have plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. And if we look at our previous results for irreducible representations, we see that that set of characters is B1, the irreducible representation B1. So we would say in C2V, the vector x transforms as B1. And we make a notation of that in the last column of our building character table here. And finally, we can do y. y, well, again, E does nothing on it, plus 1. The C2 flips its sense, so we have a minus 1. Sigma v, now sigma v is now perpendicular to y, so this flips it into the negative of itself. y lies in sigma v prime, so nothing happens to it. It's a plus 1. So from this we get the characters 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. And when we look in our rudimentary character table, those are the characters that correspond to b2. So here we can say in C2V, the vector y transforms as B2. So those are what we see in Appendix C as the listings for unit vector transformations in the point group C2V. Now what about these R's that we see? Well, the R's are representing rotations about the indicated axis in the subscript of the notation there. For example, here is a little unit vector rotating about R. And it has a certain sense of motion. And I could take this in one sense or the other. It doesn't really matter. All I'm looking at here is how does that sense change, if at all, under the operations of E, uh, or of C2B, rather. Under E, RZ is the result, so it's a plus 1. C2 just flips it around in the same direction that it's going. It doesn't change its sense of direction. So that would be a plus 1. But now sigma v, the sigma v is the plane of the page here. Imagine this little vector coming around to the mirror plane. It would so figuratively see itself coming in the opposite direction. In other words, the operation of sigma v changes the sense of rotation. So we have a minus 1. 
The same is true in the yz plane. The little vector would see itself uh, as it approached the mirror plane, and so we have a sense of change of direction, minus 1. Okay, so we get the characters plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and those are the characters that we find for the irreducible representation A2. So we say in C2V, the vector RZ transforms as A2. Now we can do that same process on Y and on X, and I invite you to do that, and we'll find that the rotational vector R, uh, R sub X transforms as B2, and the vector Ry transforms as B1. And so those then are the indications we see in the character table that you will find in the back of your book, or any book that deals with symmetry and group theory for that matter. So that accounts for this last column in this and all other character tables.